Okay. Okay. Well, uh, let me just start by saying thank you to Positive Luxury and to uh, Diana uh, Verde Nieto specifically for inviting me to join you for this webcast. So the, um, the plan is that I'm going to talk to you for about 20 minutes and then we're going to have 10 minutes of Q&A. And hopefully that will get uh, uh, cover all the issues that, that, that you are interested in. But before I start, I'm just going to show a three and a half minute video, which is a nice summary of the work that we do at uh, National Geographic Pristine Seas. So uh, Claudia is going to press play on that now, I believe. Can you hear the, the sound that you have? been to so many places but every time is like the first time we don't know what we're going to find every dive is going to be a surprise theater with everything you ever wanted to see underwater just whizzing past you it's shark paradise a healthy shark population is a healthy ecosystem these remote untouched places they are the only baselines we have left for what the ocean used to be like they are like the instruction manual of the ocean a few fishing boats and they can remove hundreds of years of biomass in just a very short period of time. There's a lot going on to raise awareness of these big oceanic problems. But the real trick is what can we do about it? Dos nuevos parques y o áreas marinas protegidas. Y se constituye en un líder mundial en la conservación marina. En los últimos años se han creado más reservas marinas que en toda la historia de la humanidad. Sin embargo, todavía se puede pescar en el 98% de los océanos del mundo. Y cada país tiene que hacer mucho más para poder proteger más de sus océanos. Seeing the planet as it used to be. See the ocean as it should be. And try to bring it back. After that very dramatic video, um, I'm going to now tell you a bit about uh, National Geographic Pristine Seas and our work around the world. So I'm going to just run you through uh, six slides. I'm going to show you that. Uh, I'm going to share the deck with you now and then uh, switch back uh, when the slideshow is finished so that we can have a discussion. So. Our mission at National Geographic is to protect 30% of the planet by 2030. And why is this necessary? Uh, which, quite frankly, is 
Can you all hear me okay? I'm, I'll take a bit of that. So we are undergoing at the moment a global nature crisis. Um, perhaps some of you may have seen a, a report published by the United Nations that was in the media last month in May. Um, it, it was produced with the, by a, a group called the um, IPES uh, group, which the United Nations can always be relied upon to come up with the most boring name for um, committees and process imaginable. But uh, this committee is called the Intergovernmental Science Policy um, Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. So that really rolls off the tongue. Um, but um, notwithstanding its very non-catchy name, the issue that it was reporting on is literally one of the biggest issues in the world. It is as big an issue as climate change, and it is about the loss of global nature and how that impacts on all of mankind and not just on nature itself, because of course we are part of nature. So the report was put together uh, over a three-year period by uh, 145 scientific experts from 50 countries. So it is comprehensive and peer-reviewed and very, very deep. And I won't go through the, uh, its findings in great detail now, but the top lines are that they recognize that humanity is facing, the planet is facing an extinction crisis previously unseen in human history and that we are looking at the probability of one million species of plants and animals lost forever that is extinct over the next few decades. And uh, this applies to both land and to sea. And our work at National Geographic Pristine Seas has focused primarily on, on the ocean. But the oceans are in considerable crisis. 90% of the big fish are gone. By that I mean the big, beautiful, charismatic species, the sharks, the turtles, the dolphins, the little fish like swordfish and marlin. Nine out of 10 of them have already been caught. And you might ask, where have they gone? Well, we have eaten them, or we have killed them in the process of catching them, which we are, uh, uh, which we uh, wish to eat. So, uh, global fisheries are also um, uh, putting enormous stress on the, on, on the ocean. Uh, over 90% of uh, global fisheries are either um, you know, maxed out, so fishing at their absolute maximum capacity, or are already overexploited. So only 7% of the world's fisheries are being fished within their natural limits. So this is a serious, serious issue. And it is so serious that one wonders, you know, why don't we, why don't we hear about this uh, uh, every day? It's, it's, it's such, a, such a huge issue. And there are a number of reasons for that, uh, which are perhaps too broad for discussion here, but one of them I'd like you to consider is an issue called shifting baselines, which is uh, to say that if your grandfather came back today or your grandmother and looked at the countryside, they would say, my goodness, where have all the birds gone? Where have all the wildflowers gone? Where have all the bees gone? But we don't notice that in our lifetime because our lifetime is so short and the baseline has moved very abruptly over a very quick period of time, but so much so that we do not notice the difference. So what we think as being normal, you know, lots of nature, lots of fish, lots of birds is not normal. We're, all, we're, we're already in a crisis situation. And if previous generations uh, were to come back and see the state of global nature now, they would be horrified. So of course, it's our responsibility in our generation to ensure that we end this crisis now. So the positive news is, I'm very glad to say, is that all of this is eminently fixable. There's a lot of things that we can do the technology, the practice, the processes involved in, in, in ending the extinction crisis. They, these answers are already known to us, they already exist. Really all that's missing is the political will to make them happen. 
So there are lots of different things that one can do, organizations, governments, people can do to end the extinction crisis and restore nature. But one of them is setting aside large parts of the land and the ocean for nature. And that is the issue that we are focusing on at National Geographic, Pristine Cities, and its partner terrestrial campaign, Last Wild Places. So one doesn't need to be a scientist to understand this, which is if you set aside parts of forest and mega diverse and special parts of nature and give wildlife and nature a chance to rebound and for uh, uh, populations to recover, then nature is incredibly resilient and it will thrive. The same goes for the ocean. If you set aside parts of the ocean under what we call marine protected areas uh, and, and prevent industrial scale fishing, very large commercial fishing in those areas, then uh, fish life is very resilient. It's very bountiful and it will bounce back, but we just need to give nature a chance. So it is our ambition to, in order to halt the extinction crisis and recover nature, it is our ambition to campaign to protect 30% of the earth by 2030. And that means setting aside 30% of land and 30% of the ocean as protected areas. And we're going to do that in the next 11 years. And if we're going to do that, we need your help. We need the help of business. We need the help of governments. We need the help of the public. So just to put that in context, at the moment, we're at 15% of the land protected globally and just over 7% of the oceans. So we've got quite a way to go. But as I say, the good news is we know what we need to do. The technology already exists to do it. The, the, you know, the, the legal process and property access and process already exists to do it. So we just need to create the political will. So we have some form in this area. National Geographic Pristine Seas was founded in 2008 by a Spanish uh, marine biologist called Enrique Sala. And Enrique and his team have spent the last 10 years uh, using a very powerful and effective combination of science, media, and policy. So they have used science to identify the last pristine places left in the ocean. And they have conducted expeditions across many of these sites. You can see on the map in front of you, all the sites in green are sites that have already been designated. And the sites in blue are ones that are yet to be designated. From our local perspective in the UK, the important thing is that two of the largest sites yet to be designated are in the UK overseas territories. I'll get to that soon. So personally, I do the UK government affairs for the Pristine Seas program. So much as I'd love to tell you that I was involved in all of these 20 plus designations all over the world over the past decade, uh, I haven't had that privilege, but I've been privileged enough to be uh, close to these people for the past few years and seen how effective they are. So um, Pristine Seas, the, the, the model is the, we, we, we uh, conduct an expedition. So you go and uh, bring scientists um, to these uh, last pristine places or relatively pristine, because sadly really nowhere is left pristine in the ocean anymore in the world. But the, these relatively pristine places, you conduct science to make the case as to why these places are special and, and deserve to be protected. And you create beautiful media around it. You, you do underwater and overwater filming and do interviews with the local communities where there, where there is a local community. And you produce a beautiful package that says, this is a very special place. And then you take the science and you take the media and you bring it back to governments. And you show it to the local government in the, in the area that is uh, hopefully going to host the marine protected area. But you would also bring it back to national governments if it's a French overseas territory or a UK overseas territory, or if it's a US territory or Chilean or a small island state in the Pacific and so on. So this has been a very effective model for the past 10 years. So successful that 
uh, it is now being developed uh, uh, partnering with the National Geographic um, terrestrial campaign to, to and called Last Wild Places. So it is our hope using this model of science and media and policy that we can advocate globally to protect 30% of the planet by 2030. So as most of you are in the UK, or I think most of you in the UK, I am, I'm, I'm in London. Um, so I'm just gonna tell you a, uh, a bit about uh, the UK's role in all this, which is actually very significant. The UK has 16 overseas territories uh, dotted around the world, uh, the, sort of the confetti of empire. They are parts of the United Kingdom legally, but they just happen to be in other parts of the world. They're in the South Atlantic, the Pacific, Caribbean, the Antarctic, the Mediterranean. So they, they are highly representative of different ecosystems around the world. And many of them are very remote, which means that there's a great opportunity to protect some of the last pristine pieces of ocean in the world. So at the moment, it is, we are part of a process called uh, the, the Blue Belt. And we are hoping to secure over the next uh, 12 months, uh, 1 million square kilometers of ocean protected in the South Atlantic. Um, about uh, 400,000 square kilometers at, a, at a, an island called Ascension Island. And um, uh, yet to be determined, but approximately, we could say five or 600,000 uh, at a UK overseas territory called Tristan Kuna. And we're working closely with the communities in those, uh, uh, on those islands and uh, making sure that whatever we develop there, um, what it will restrict is industrial scale, commercial fishing coming into their waters with, you know, some of these lines, uh, some of these ships, so it's quite extraordinary. They, they have a um, maybe 100, 130 kilometer long fishing lines maybe 3,000, three to three and a half thousand hooks, each one baited, hunting for fishing for tuna, but of course in the process pulling out all sorts of beautiful charismatic species and denuding these wonderful places of their turtles, their sharks, their, their dolphins, their swordfish, their marlin. The, and so these are some of the last places in the world where these beautiful big fish are still left because as I said, nine out of 10 of them are gone. So we are working with the UK government to ensure that they can be protected. Um, it's very interesting. Uh, I, I'll gladly talk about it in the Q&A, but uh, we're using satellites. Uh, there's some really innovative satellite technologies available now to, uh, to uh, allow for the waters. So the, the legal situation is that 200 miles off of a country's coast are uh, the territorial waters of that country. And that applies with these UK overseas territories. So the, um, they are considered British waters for 200 miles uh, off of all of these islands around the world, which means that Ascension Island has uh, territorial waters um, twice the size of the UK. Uh, Tristan de Luna more than three times the size of the UK. And beyond those, it's really, it's what's called the high seas, international waters. So these UK overseas territories represent uh, sort of embassies of law and order in an otherwise lawless uh, and quite ungoverned high seas international waters. So it's a really important opportunity. The UK can be very proud of the, of the political commitment it's given. It started under David Cameron. It's, co it's continued under Theresa May. Michael Gove has been extremely supportive as Environment Secretary. Um, and we hope that will continue in the UK regardless of uh, what Prime Minister. Um, so... Um, that, so, so the UK is in a very interesting position. So just, just um, before we break up at 20 past, because I'm aware I want to leave some time for questions, what does all this mean for you? What can you do uh, in, the, in the luxury uh, fashion industry? Well, first thing is we'd be delighted if you could go online to globaldealfornature.org and sign our petition which calls for the protection of 30% of the ocean by 2030 and 30% of the land by 2030. And then also, um, if you're interested in considering and being involved in thought leadership about what your industry could do to lead business, to lead consumers 
to lead policymakers in ensuring that we secure this global deal for nature, but also ensuring that your supply chains are not sourcing rare leather hides and, and, and so on from some of these charismatic and rare species that are found in the ocean and can often be caught in these highly destructive ways. So it's not just about is the species uh, under threat, um, it, it's also even if it's an abundant species, in what manner is that species caught? Is it caught in a manner which kills lots of other species in what's called bycatch? Uh, and then whilst you might be catching something from a healthy stock, you might be damaging a, a threatened stock in the process. So these are all really important considerations for the luxury fashion industry to consider and can obviously lead by example across the fashion and retail sectors. So we would ask you to, to get in touch with Diana and uh, her, her colleague, Natalie Welsh, um, if you want to get involved via Positive Luxury in some thought leadership about protecting nature over the next decade. Um, and we hope that that will feed into, sorry, your participation is required for a decade. <laughs> the process uh, is going to take place over a decade. Um, and uh, this thought leadership will feed into um, a World Economic Forum coalition, which has been assembled called Business for Nature. And the last thing I say to you is to just please keep talking to colleagues, talking to friends, talking to family about the nature crisis and just reminding people that actually the solutions are out there and it doesn't need to be like this. We can make a change. We can protect and restore nature so that future generations can enjoy what our, what our grandparents and great-grandparents would have seen and what we can only hope we can, we can restore again for the future. So at that, I'm going to wind up and leave. Um, I'm, I've got certainly more than five minutes. I'm sorry, I think I've spoken more than I should have. But there's at least five or maybe 10 minutes if you have time to take questions. So thank you very much for, for listening to me. Um, right, now I'm going to Q&A. So, I have three questions already. Uh, well, first is a statement saying, delighted to, to hear this um, close to World Oceans Day. So yes, as a mom. So um, one of the questions was, what can civil everyday person do to help out at pristine seas? Well, I hope I went some way towards uh, answering that question. Um, I think that you can, um, if you live in the United Kingdom, there's a, there's a few things you can do. One is you can um, go online and sign our petition. But also, it'd be fantastic if you could look up who your member of parliament is and uh, if you could write to them and, and ask them to support the Blue Belt, which is the UK uh, campaign to protect the overseas territories. So um, it, there's a, a coalition of NGOs in the UK uh, campaigning on this. And the campaign is called Back the Blue Belt. So if you just Google Back the Blue Belt, and you'll see a website there that will allow you to, uh, um, to, to write to your MP about it. Um, so, and that will, be, that will be excellent. And also, um, uh, if you want to go beyond that, I would request that you ask your MP not just to support the Blue Belt, but to support uh, the UK showing leadership on this 30 by 30, which is please protect 30% of the planet by 2030, and that is both ocean and land. The UK is in a very strong position on this. The UK is currently at 26% of its marine estate is already protected. That's thanks to the overseas territories. And it's about, uh, about the same, uh, actually 28%, I think, on land. So the UK is in a strong position to lead on this uh, in this international process that's currently underway at the United Nations um, to secure uh, what's called the Convention on Biological Diversity, another really uh, uh, easy name to remember from the UN, the CBD, the Convention on Biological Diversity, it ends, uh, well, the, the talks are taking place at the moment and we hope will conclude successfully 
um, in October of 2020, so just over a year away, at a big meeting in China, uh, in a city called Kunming in China. And uh, I would urge all of you to write to your member of parliament and ask them to ask the foreign secretary and the environment secretary, and indeed the prime minister, for the UK to show leadership on securing 30% of the planet protected by 2030. So thank you for that. Um, next question, MPAs focus on specific sites. Uh, however, the aquatic life move and try to what is the solution? That is a very good, very good question. So um, there are migratory species, uh, for example, tuna uh, moves around a lot, so it might breed in one country's waters, but then migrate through international waters to uh, spend time in another country's waters. And of course, it's vulnerable to, to fishing the whole way. So there's also a process underway to try and protect nature in international waters. And this is another UN process um, which um, is, is underway. And another catchy title, BBNJ, Biodiversity Beyond National Jurisdiction. Uh, and we hope that uh, by next summer, there will be a new international treaty to protect nature on the high seas, which means that you can actually protect migratory corridors that go through international waters from one national uh, um, uh, waters to the next. Then uh, a final question, do you think there are enough ocean specific platforms, whether they be broadcast, digital print, uh, event or product focused to communicate the messages of this campaign? Um, no, is, is my is my answer um, uh, because I think the general there's not a general understanding or perception from the public that there is an ocean crisis. I don't think people realize that 90% of fish stocks are either um, you know fished to their maximum or overfished and I don't think people understand that uh, that oceans are incredibly vulnerable to climate change and acidification. What has been very good for public awareness is the plastics crisis. And plastics is important, but um, it's, you know, to be frank, it's not as big a deal for the ocean ecosystem as overfishing or climate change. But still, as, a, as an entry to the ocean crisis, it's a really important topic for people to get their head around. Um, and um, so um, uh, a question is, within government, who are your warmest supporters? Is there an obvious way of getting corporates involved? So um, I, I would say uh, that uh, the Environment Secretary Michael Gove has been extremely supportive and uh, we are grateful to him for his leadership on this. Um, Prime Minister understandably has been somewhat distracted with other issues and the Foreign Secretary equally so, but the Foreign Secretary's Junior ministers have been supportive. Um, but importantly, we have 285 members of parliament in the UK which have signed a Blue Belt Charter, uh, which is uh, you know, a call of support for the Blue Belt policy. So as I said earlier, um, we'd love if you could write to your MP and ask them to support the Blue Belt Charter, but then also to support 30 by 30. Um, is there an obvious way of getting corporates involved? I think corporates, you know, the best way corporates can lead is by making sure that their footprint and their supply chain is uh, sustainable. You know, I'm not a running, a, this isn't a corporate responsibility um, a, a discussion, but I'm sure the Positive Luxury could advise you on, on supply chain transparency and provenance. Um, okay, uh, and then finally, how does seafood choices impact on this? And should we simply just choose fish in the Good Fish Guide? Well, uh, yes, uh, seafood choices are very important. Um, I think the Good Fish Guide, which is a, a useful app that you can download, produced by the Marine Conservation Society, is a good start. I probably think it's, it's a bit too much information on it, so it's rather, it's rather confusing. But they have a traffic light system of, you know, red, do not eat, 
amber consider where it's from or green feel you know you, you can feel comfortable to eat it so I, I would recommend that um i would also recommend that you just avoid certain eating certain species you know i would not eat shrimp or prawns that come from the far east because uh, of the way that they are farmed that denudes mangroves swamps I would not eat um, tuna because of the way that it's caught using long lines or purse-saying nets, which catch a lot of other species. Uh, so unless it's you know one by one pole and line caught, I wouldn't eat it. Um, look out for the Marine Stewardship Council, the blue tick on a lot of uh, um, fish products in UK retailers. I think UK retailers are trying really hard. I think they're doing a really good job of understanding this and trying to get to the bottom of it they're you know they've they've done a lot of good work but they're not there uh you know they're, they're not perfect yet and they wouldn't pretend to be um but i think you know consumers need to send the signal that you will not buy irresponsibly called seafood but you're happy to reward fishermen that do the right thing because you know fishermen are good people they work hard they love the ocean they uh you know they they know more about the ocean than anyone. So the ones that fish responsibly deserve to be supported. And, and uh, you know, we are not anti-fishing. We are anti-destructive uh, industrial fishing. We are very much in favor of, of people fishing uh, responsibly and sustainably. Um, so I think at, at that, I will, I will have to wrap it up. Um, I hope that was useful. Yes, thank you very much, Adrian. It was, it was really interesting and it was great learning more about uh, Pristine's work and what we can do uh, to support your work. Um, thank you very much. Um, if you have any additional questions, please, um, you can send it to marketing at positiveluxury.com or uh, contact us through our social media channel and we will get back to you shortly. Um, our next webinar will be on the 18th of June and um, we'll be with June Sarpon, TV and um, uh, television presenter and author June Sarpon, and we'll be talking about diversity. Um, thank you again, Adrienne. Thank you all for attending the webinar and see you soon.